Future Talk Radio. You're in to all things music. Making it is not losing who you are despite of the world. I, I don't really affiliate monetary success with making it. I, I affiliate character success. Um, I've seen success change people. Um, and then they become a prisoner to that success. And they, that's not making it to me. Um, I think making it is, is staying true to who you're here to be. And um, yeah, I guess that's as succinct as I can say it. Thank you. <laughs> Welcome to Making It with Terry Woolman, the show that explores the secrets, successes, and strategies for making it in the music biz. And now, here's your host, Terry Woolman. Welcome to Making It with me, your host, Terry Wallman. I really appreciate all of you every week joining us on these shows, and uh, we do these for you. So thanks for going on this journey with me and with my guest. Um, By the way, you can find all of our episodes archived at entertalkmedia.com, or you can download or stream for free any of our episodes on iTunes or various other places. So just look up Making It with Terry Wallman. I created this show to focus on what it takes to create and maintain a lasting career in the music industry. And um, today, I'm very happy to have a guest who's a very good example of how to do that. I'm sitting here in my studio with artist uh, Christy Crow, and um, we're going to be talking about a lot of great things. So let me first tell you about her. Christy Crow is currently conductor band leader of Cirque du Soleil's Amaluna. A lifelong music professional, Christy has toured the world as a top 20 adult contemporary artist in addition to having an extensive sidelining career where she experienced the world and the studio with such music legends as Barbara Streisand, Julie Andrews, Norris Barkley, Engelbert Humperdinck, and has performed in hundreds of concerts around the United States and abroad as conductor keyboardist of the Grammy-winning band Mannheim Steamroller. She is also the first woman conductor of the hit Broadway musical Wicked and has over two decades worth of studio music credits as a singer, songwriter, keyboard player, and composer arranger for titles that include Star Wars Rogue One, Star Trek Beyond, Jurassic World, and Planet of the Apes. Christy also holds a technology entrepreneurship certificate from Stanford University a Master of Music degree in Media Writing and Production, as well as a Bachelor's of Music degree in Keyboard Performance from the University of Miami. She is also the founder of ProMusicDB.org, the professional music credits database and archive whose mission is to promote, preserve, foster, and advance careers in music and in the digital world. Christy Crow, welcome to the show. I'm so happy to be here. Hi, Terry Wellman. <laughs> Hi, Christy. Um, and it's it's always a, a pleasure to actually be face to face with my guests because sometimes they're call in interviews, and my favorite are when I actually get to sit in the room with the person that that I'm talking to. Oh, me too. So uh, let's start off by me just acknowledging something that I think is. Sadly, remarkable, but it's also very <laughs> wonderful. You are the first woman conductor of the hit Broadway musical Wicked, which is just fantastic. You also created a website for SAG After Singers called Pro Singers Access, and also a database to archive musicians' recording credits called ProMusicDB.org. And you have a very large and sweet Bernese mountain dog named Bowie, <laughs> who, who I adore. <laughs> Um, that's a lot. You were just such a force of nature, Christy. Oh, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like the force of nature is um, blowing against me sometimes, but I appreciate that. <laughs> can, can you talk for a moment about where you get your focus and, and your energy? Gosh, you know, um, I just think I'm a natural born problem solver. I, I can't really explain it other than that. Um, when there's problems or I hear 
people express problems in their careers or in organizations, I guess I just I want to help fix it. So that's why there's such a, I think, an eclectic blend of all these things um, in my past careers that I've done. Just it wouldn't seem like a normal career path for someone like me to do. Um, I just hear about problems. I'm like, huh, how can we solve that? Mm -hmm. And that's how those things evolve most of the time. Yeah. (laughs) That's probably why I relate to you so well. (laughs) (laughs) There's so many problems. Uh, let, let's go back um, because you you know one of the things there's a couple things I want to talk about today um, s- certainly mentoring and teaching because mm-hmm. it's such a big part of what you and I both do and you've got a very strong point of view and, and by the way listeners get some paper and pencil on this one because um, Christy's going to be sharing some really wonderful tips really about how to be successful uh, but yeah, before we go back to that, I want to talk about your early music career. You know, growing up in your family, your your first performance was at age five. Yeah, as uh, Annie. <laughs> um, yeah, my uh, my dad in the area I grew up in, and at the time I grew up in, there was a very popular group called Up with People, mm-hmm. which is I think pretty similar to what the Young Americans are and today. the New Christy Minstrels. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I'm um, a group of about uh, thirty singers and a. 11 or 12 piece band mm-hmm. uh, depending on the venue um, and my dad uh, co-directed that group and naturally my brother and I were kind of brought in as the uh, the kids as soon as possible so they did a production that included um, some Broadway uh, numbers and they would actually do some Broadway shows sometimes but I was Annie in this one particular one that was my first yeah, stage performance head down and crossing my legs <laughs> at all. But I, I think I sang pretty well. But, yeah, that was my first. I played it, and, yeah, that was it. Did you, when you were a kid, did you see yourself, or did you identify more as a singer or as a pianist or as an actor or or all Gosh, the above, or you didn't really think about it? You I just... never, I, acting really never um, grabbed my heart. Mm-hmm. It was always music. Mm-hmm. Um, I would probably sing and play um, and I, I just love to figure stuff out. Again, problem solving. So I would listen to records. And actually, as, as I got a little older, and by older I mean like 10, 11, um, my dad's group would be performing numbers and they couldn't find the right arrangement within the arrangements that they would buy you know, for the performances. So a lot of times uh, I would get recordings or we, it, were, it would be in a different key. And um, they would just give me the the track and say, Christy, figure this out, whether it be the synth part or a backing vocal or sometimes a, an instrumental line that um, we had you know, different instrumentation than what the arrangement was that they had um, licensed. So I just started doing, I guess you call it takedowns, but to me it was just like learning numbers. Um, so that's, yeah, it was always music. I was just always fascinated by um by the musical end, uh, whether it would be playing or, or I would sing some parts sometimes. But, yeah, it was never the acting part. Well, you have um, a really strong early foundation in your, your musical training. Uh, at, you know, at you, as a child, you were studying with, um, with a concert pianist who was a Juilliard. Yes. Uh, uh, Sung Mi Rae. Sung Mi Rae. Um, yes, and she actually was the first woman to represent... Uh, South Korea, or the first woman in the Van Cliburn competition, if I recall correctly, and she represented South Korea at the time, a very young girl. So she, by some happenstance, um, lived in our area outside of Washington, D.C., and her mm-hmm. husband was a professor um, at a university, not in music, um, and she taught, and how I ended up taking from her was that my my mom and dad taught um, uh, uh, <laughs> Sunday school. So that's the word I was looking for. Mm-hmm. My mom and dad taught Sunday school. And one of the uh, kids in their high school, Sunday school class, would practice at the church um, that we went to at the time. And he was 12 and winning all these competitions. And he played Rhapsody in Blue one, one morning when my mom was just getting to church and heard him. And she's like, we have to find out who his teacher is. <laughs> and that's how that happened. So I went and auditioned um, for his teacher. And I owe her so much. I think up to that point, um, from what I understand, I don't remember not ever playing or singing. Mm-hmm. It's always been part of 
who I am and my genetics, I guess. But, um, but going to this teacher was something specific because I had kind of outgrown. There were community teachers that I'd gone to. My dad actually, with his group, um, also taught the uh, chorus at the uh, college that my dad taught at. And um, I was taking from the accompanist for the chorus, but I was, you know, I was so young at the time. And no other teacher would take me, so it was kind of a, a big deal to kind of go to this other um, kind of big world-renowned pianist and say, "Can you teach our really young daughter?" Uh-huh. Um, but and I owe her so much. It was you know classical, of course, but um, the discipline and the process of you know doing what we do or problem solving, mm-hmm. I think, really came from her training. And I have everything to. Um, her, I've had just really great teachers. So from an early age, I had a really great foundation. Well, clearly, because you were the youngest contestant to win the Maryland State Piano Concerto yeah. competition at, <laughs> at age thirteen. You know, I was yeah. you know figuring out how to catch a ball, and you know. <laughs> and I was stunned when that happened. They announced that I was still sitting in my seat, and I remember my parents going, they, "That's you," because you know you, you you go in and you you play and you have the judges there and you know, you don't know anything. And then at the end, you just kind of all go back into the room, all the contestants and you're, you're waiting and they announced my name and it didn't even hit me. Like, and my parents are like, go up there. That's you. And I was like, are you kidding me? (laughs) So yeah, that was a surprise. But, um, again, uh, all my teachers, uh, all the te- all the credit goes to my you know great teacher at that mm-hmm. time for preparing me for that. Well, you've you've had a, a wonderful education, and you know, going on to get your master's degree mm-hmm. as well as um, you know working on your your PhD. Mm-hmm. And and one of the questions I wanted to ask you about this because there's two parts to this. And 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 by the way, there's a similarity. Um, I, we had another guest on the show, uh, Tina Guo, who is a oh, wonderful Tina. cellist and, and friend of both of ours. Mm-hmm. And um, Tina is a very accomplished cellist and composer. And she didn't complete her formal uh, college training. You know, you had an opportunity after being a recipient of a full scholarship to get your doctorate, which is <laughs> mind boggling um, and really very exciting. But you had job career opportunities that I came did. up and you made a decision to not complete your doctorate. I, yeah. um, I personally don't think that has hurt you in any way. Do you feel any sort of sense of incompletion or regret on that? Um, no, not for what I do. Good. But there have been times like in this going into this kind of education uh, discussion, I think that we want to have today yes. where I feel that had I had my doctorate I would be able to bring about more change within education because more universities would be open because I had a doctorate to yeah. discussing some ideas that we're going to discuss today. Got it. If that makes sense. It does. Yeah. It, it would give you more credibility or street cred in the academia world. Right. Um, I I don't have a doctorate either. I, as a matter of fact, I didn't uh, even go as far as a master's. I started to, and then I'd work opportunities and made a decision that I, although I've always taught, and mentored that education was not going to be the main thing that I was pursuing. And, and that's a decision that you made as well. Mm -hmm. Um, but you know, we are both at this point of our lives where, um, it's clearly time to, to share information and knowledge and, and give back and create change in every way that we know Mm -hmm. how to do that. Um, so, you know, we, we can jump into that right now. Great. Um, cause I know it's something that's, that's dear to both of us. Mm-hmm. And, and, you know, just so people really understand this about you too, you know, you've been also been a guest speaker at national music industry and academic conferences, including music biz, the, the American library association. Yeah. Uh, you, you've spoken, um, all over the world and been even for the United nations, you know, you were invited to speak, uh, as an advocate for music and education, uh, Talk about that very briefly for a second before we get into the master class. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, how I how that occurred um, was I was playing actually in in Los Angeles. I was a music director for a temple, mm-hmm. and at the temple, um, I was at the time kind of uh, during some instrumental parts that I needed to cover. I would uh, kind of experiment with some new songs I was doing for my first album ever. Mm-hmm. This was twenty years ago, <laughs> and. Um, so uh, it just so happened that 
someone attending the temple um, was putting together a festival at the United Nations and um, had been doing so for a number of years and would bring over artists as guests and, and kind of feature them at the United Nations if they felt that the theme of their work, you know, was kind of congruent with the work that the United Nations is doing. And it just so happened that this one particular piece, which I believe is going to be on the bumper today, mm -hmm. um, was chosen as kind of the theme song for this festival. What's the name of that song? Um, it's called I See Light. I See Light. Um, so it was chosen as the theme, and I was invited to United Nations. And then while I was there playing for the f um, festival in Victoria Hall, um, they also invited me to come and speak on a roundtable session um, about arts and education while I was there. So that was kind of my first I guess, high-ended high talk mm -hmm. <laughs> um, about the importance of arts and education. And actually, it was really received well. And um, we had a lot of attendance um, from international uh, United Nations representatives, um, which was really encouraging to see the belief about how um, there are no walls in music or, or the arts. You know, we all create and creative beings, and it's really encouraging to see. It was encouraging at that time to see how well-received um, kind of my speaking about, you know, academia, I, I, I believe we all need to know, you know, math and history and things. But as a connecting force, I believe the arts is really what um, brings the best out of us as humans. So would you say that was at the time and, and continues to be your musical vision? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Music can change the world. And I'm a hundred percent believer in that. <laughs> mm -hmm. So it's kind of your open to it, yeah. your mission statement, My mantra, yeah. to your life, your mantra. <laughs> yeah, I do. Uh, and how how exactly do you feel like on a daily basis that you are healing the world through music and changing the world? Gosh, on a daily basis. Um, well, here's what I try to do. It may not happen every day, but I, I believe there's there's a connection um, both in receiving when you hear music and when you're performing music um, that when it's good and together and then the right kind of vibe, as we call it, you kind of get a natural high from it. Like there's a buzz um, and you may not know what it comes from, but I believe it, I believe it comes from kind of this feeling we get either when we're performing and the band is just locking and you're like, yeah. Or as an audience member, you can feel that the band is locking. It's just kind of this energy so, um, and it's a very collaborative energy. Absolutely. Um, absolutely. And it takes everyone, not just one person, you know, produces it. But I think when it's right, it just emanates this, you know, we all want to be better humans when you hear stuff, when you experience, um, music in that way. Mm -hmm. Um, so I, if, if that answers your question, I, I hope it does just kind of how, yeah. how, um, on a daily basis, whether you're playing or hearing or listening, um, it's just about the experience of music. Well, and you know, one way daily that I observe you getting to create change in the world every day and touch people is by the the role that you're that you're holding currently in the Cirque du Soleil show. <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah, which which expands beyond music to mm. physical yes. artists, performers, and audience members. It's amazing to watch um, these artists do what they do every day, and mm -hmm. then to kind of be at the helm of of the musical uh, accompaniment to that and, and enhancing that experience for them and for the audience. So it, it's a very, again, it's very collaborative. It's <laughs> not just listening, it's watching and, and triggering and calling is what I do in this show. Um, so it's, there's elements that aren't musical, but the, um, the experience I think is, is musical and visual. I'm, and I'm glad that you just said there are moments that are not musical yeah. because, because one of the things as a fellow music director mm -hmm. and producer um, and conductor and, all, mm -hmm. you know, all the, the things we do in addition to being players don't have very much to do sometimes with music or they don't oh, feel sure. like they do. But in in actuality, they have everything to do yes. with, with it because it, it helps create the possibility of music happening. Absolutely. But it's it's do you find that it's um, as challenging as I find um, to to wear all of those hats, you know, to be creative, but also to be um, the the intermediary intermediary between all the parties, you know, the management and and artist and everything. Oh, sure. Well, on a daily basis, um, my current job, um, 
on a daily basis, I have to do a lot of music editing per se, a lot of music programming, um, because every day our show change changes mm -hmm. um, due to you know an acrobat may be ill or may an act may be out or or we may be putting something new in. Um, or something may have to come out, just a portion of it, because that particular trick, someone can't do that that day. Mm -hmm. so, um, I, so my day would start with um, knowing what those changes are and having to make those changes and then you know, adjusting your brain to then, okay, now we have a sound check, and then adjusting your brain to, okay, now we have um, lineup meeting, and then, okay, adjusting your brain to whatever. I have a project coming up next week that I got to, you know, start thinking about and then adjusting to now I have to get ready for the show <laughs> <laughs> and then adjusting to, okay, so now I'm in the band pit and, um, I'm triggering and, you know, playing, you know, while this is happening. So on a daily basis, it's, it's a constant revolving, um, door between, you know, being the musician, being kind of help, uh, helpful in leadership and management and being the, the technician, being the, kind of this all-encompassing thing and i don't think i'm unique in that i think that's like you said yeah it's the job you know, description it, it's what's happening now with our um with technology it's just kind of the expectation that we become these you know kind of full circle humans mm -hmm. that can like you have your own studio here and we're here today so you can run all the equipment we don't have to have a tech here you mm -hmm. have to run that but then to do the show now you have to do the editing and um piece it all together and then um, you'll go out tonight and play your gig, right? Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, um, it's, I think, what all of us are doing now. Right. Yep. It's more than one thing. Mm -hmm. um, it leads me to one more question before we go on to the, the, the teaching part of this. You know, one of the things that you just left out in that very long list of daily um, tasks and intentions is taking care of yourself personally, oh. physically, emotionally, mentally. How do you... What's my stress management technique? Yes. <laughs> and your <laughs> for lack of better words. Yeah, yes. and your mental and physical health management yes. technique. Um <laughs> for me, um I'm a an avid, I guess, walker. Mm -hmm. So, um in this particular job, my schedule's first thing I do and we're um 10 minutes from the beach where I'm staying right now. So, I I do about a good 4 to 5 miles every morning, you know. Um and that kind of helps me focus and clear my head, kind of the brain drain. Mm -hmm. Um, then I do some kind of additional physical exercise for I have some maintenance issues with my shoulder that from an injury. we'll talk about from yeah. an injury. Mm -hmm. um, and actually just eating correctly, taking supplements, the whole thing, you know, it's, it's an all-encompassing thing because I have to be focused. If we have two shows during a day, that's like five hours of staring at a screen and being ready at a moment's notice to make a change that happens on you know in a live environment. Um, this is very different from a normal kind of orchestra pit situation. Yeah. Um, so I've learned in order to kind of have my focus be prime every, you know, show, I do have to take care of myself. I have to eat right and not, you know, carb out. Because <laughs> <You know? laughs> that was my usual stress mechanism is, you know, um, carbon out. But I can't do that now. <laughs> so it's the walk, it's the supplements, and it's the uh, – um, exercise and it's you know eating the right foods so that you don't get brain fog mm -hmm. thanks for answering <laughs> that <laughs> being way honest here so. well i'm and i'm so happy to to hear you talk about the importance of uh, making sure that you take care of yourself yes you know, along the way or there there is no way mm -hmm. and I, I think that also people that you work with don't realize that sometimes as a um you know they they think that I don't know, like music is a, is a talent and it's kind of a magical talent, yes. But um, we still have to take care of ourselves and it's not like a, we, a switch sometimes. You just turn off and on, you know. Oh, well, they can just play that, da da da, da you know. There are um, changes that incur stress, that incur, um, I guess, that really require great mental focus, you know. And um, if we don't have the discipline to kind of take care of ourselves, then we can kind of really fall short, Um when a lot's required of us. Mm -hmm. Well said. <laughs> and I'm in complete agreement on mm -hmm. that. So let's get to the part of the conversation that I'm the most excited about, and I know you are too, yes. um, something that's very dear to both of us, which is mentoring and teaching. And you have come up with five fundamental principles and, and techniques that, you, that uh, I know that you are 
putting a lot of attention to um, getting this information out there uh, for our next generation of young artists. And I want you to, in addition to sharing those five principles, um, I want you to talk about what's up with that and, you know, what this, this plan to make the world a better place through music education as well is about for you. I'm excited to talk about this. Let me go back and explain maybe the, where this kind of kernel um, developed Mm -hmm. Um, in my hometown. There's a performing arts high school that did not exist when I was growing up. Which town is that? Um, near near Hagerstown, Maryland. Mm-hmm. And um, I was invited to do an artist residency um, there for a week. And I wanted to come up with something interesting and educational for the kids other than like, going in and saying, Hi, oh, I came from here and you can go do this too and just <laughs> practice hard and, right. you know, <laughs> blah, blah, blah. Um, so I really started to think about what, what are the qualities that I think have sustained me throughout, you know, really, I've been a full-time musician my entire career. Um, that's pretty remarkable because even some of the best of the best, um, can't say that because of the state of the music industry. Correct. And, um, so I, I, I went back and I just wanted to identify and then I looked at some of my friends who are actually you know very active and still you know musicians as well like what what can I what can I encapsulate as far as concepts because curriculum is difficult to really change you know once it's set in a high school especially public high school Mm -hmm. um they have to like do they have to rehearse every day and they have to have a concert at the end of the year but but what could I add of value that would be really interesting for the kids to start learning as concepts. So I came up with these five principles that then I explored with the kids based on whatever class they were in and discipline they were in through the week. So they could be applied not just if you're a musician, but if you were a writer or if you were um, a photographer or a sculptor, you know, if the kids wanted were pursuing those different types of um, artistic ventures. So the five principles I came up with were um, collaborative skills, versatility, self-discipline, marketing, and entrepreneurship. Um, so that's kind of the kernel of um, where this next phase, I think, will go, um, was actually kind of taking that into um, this performing arts high school where I grew up, and I called it kind of the musician to musicpreneur program or the art artist to artistpreneur um, program for the week. And um, it was really exciting to see the kids kind of grasp onto some of these concepts and actually – kind of shatter some of their preconceived notions about what it really takes um, and how you have to think in order to make a living these days as a creative person. Um, So it was really interesting to go through some of these exercises um, to get them to really think through, oh, I'm not just going to put a YouTube up on, you know, or a video up on YouTube and go viral Mm -hmm. and make a lot of money. (laughs) And it's really to really get down into, okay, well, if that's your goal, how do you make that happen and really walk through these steps that then they realize, oh, <laughs> it's not as easy as that. But learning that at that age, I think is invaluable. I think I learned it by trial and error. You know, I, um, I, one of my early, uh, endeavors was I really wanted a horse. I love horses. And, um, I was 12 and I begged my folks for a horse and they're like no you're going to go off to college and you're not you know you're going to leave the horse here that's not going to happen that was but, when you got uh, realized that they were probably never going to give you the bengal tiger right. that you had been <laughs> right, begging exactly. for that was the other thing girl. i wanted i really wanted a tiger <laughs> no and by the way i'm not making that <laughs> no, up that's no. that's for real i begged them also for a bengal tiger um uh but i got stuffed tigers i had a whole collection of them <laughs> from very early age and tiger posters but um so um my first endeavor was trying to find out how I could get a horse. So, again, I had been told no by my parents, but um, I called a local stable. <laughs> <laughs> how old were you? I, I was like 11 or 12. Perfect. Okay. I called and I, um, I inquired about, I think I saw in the paper that there was a horse for sale. And I got all the stats on the horse and what kind it was and... and um, thought they would negotiate with me and then I you know my my parents had just built a a, a home and we had a pretty large property so I like scoped out and I asked the person who had the stable well you know how 
how long did it take the stable to be built and that type of thing. So I, <laughs> I was very inquisitive. I don't know why, but I had all this information. I thought, well, you know, if I just present this to my folks, you know, then for sure, <laughs> for sure, you got your they pitch can't together. turn me down. <laughs> I did. I said, here's all the information. And um, so, I, yeah, I, I just made the phone call. I wasn't scared. I just called and asked a bunch of questions. And I, I never had the I, – I, I wasn't ever fearful of uh, people hanging up on me. I just um, – I just called and got the information and had it all plotted out. And then, of course, presented to my parents, you know, here's what I want for my 12th birthday or whatever <laughs> it was. And here's how to get it. And here's the guy, you know, the stable. And here's how we can build it, da-da-da. No. So they put in a swimming pool. But, <laughs> <laughs> but I didn't get the course. <laughs> wah, wah, wah. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, that was kind of my first um entrepreneurship endeavor it, it failed but um right but but but, <laughs> you, but the failure at an early age you had a very strong intuition that failure didn't mean no. that it was a bad no. idea no. or that you have to stop or that no. it's not a positive direction failure is such no, a, just... an important part of our process exactly exactly you're gonna hit a wrong note you know same yes. thing as being a musician you're gonna hit a wrong note people around you're gonna hit wrong notes um kind of makes it more fun Things on stage are going to go wrong. Yeah, right. <laughs> you know? They do. Um, so we have to, I think I learned that it's okay um, to make mistakes. Yeah. And that actually, once you accept that about yourself, then I think you're not as fearful. It's like, okay, well, I'll, I'll try something else or I won't do that again or I'll practice in a different way so that I don't make that mistake again. But I actually tell you a little story about um, memorization and about making mistakes too. Um, and this is like I credit my teacher with. So one of the um, things that you do as a musician is you memorize a lot. And <clears throat> in uh, learning that piano concerto, <laughs> <laughs> I always had a really quick memory. Um, my parents, when I learned to read, weren't sure if I was memorizing the book or actually reading the book because <laughs> so I, I was really quick. Uh-huh. And so anyway, my um, one of the first run-throughs, I think, of the first movement of that concerto um, – my piano teacher, you know, would, I knew it was coming the next week. She's like, next week I want you to have this memorized. And I thought I had, and she sat down on you know, the couch like she would, and she would say, okay, now play me page 10, uh, last stanza of the page, left hand. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, I see where this is going. <laughs> what? <laughs> what? Cause you know, as a player, you, um, especially piano, you know, you're, and I imagine with guitar too, you're, you're very like, you know, as long as you're, I'm right-handed. So, um, as long as you're kind of got the melody going, like you're, you kind of can feel your way through it. Right. And what she was showing me is that in a different environment, on a different piano, on a different whatever, you're going to be thrown off by things and you had better, <laughs> you had better know where you are. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I mean, that kind of took me down a notch as far as my memory. Like, okay, well, that that made me realize some things about myself. So, um, And I learned that early. So you better believe it. The next week I knew that whole left hand <laughs> without my right hand. Like I practiced that way. So it, it makes your brain think differently so about you, things. So you're answering the question which that yeah. I'm getting ready to ask is, so how do you achieve that? But And it sounds like what you do is you break it down mm-hmm. in ways that you hadn't broken it down before. Yep. Yep. You isolate sections, parts, mm-hmm. left hand, right hand. And you try to burn it into your memory, much like um, when the days when you used to read uh, sheet music instead mm-hmm. of looking at your iPad, right. <laughs> <laughs> um, I would kind of have a memory in my head as far as where a certain passage was, like you would know, you know like yeah. where it was on the page. It was tactile. Yeah. Um, so I had to learn that about my left hand mm-hmm. and the left hand part, you know, not just my right hand part of like the, how it sounded together, but just the left hand by mm-hmm. itself. Yeah. <laughs> one, one of the things that when, when I was 40, I started studying karate. Um, for recovery from a bicycle accident that I had and getting a spinal fusion in my neck. And that's the short mm-hmm. version of that story. But but it was very interesting to regarding memorization, to be memorizing katas mm-hmm. and forms that were physical, um, repetitive movements that you would do or a series of movements that you would do that seemed like it was so different from anything else I had ever done before. But it actually, I found that it was... Everything that I did in karate made me a better musician. Mm. 
because yeah. of the way it was retraining my brain or broadening my process in how to learn things that were new and different and awkward, uncomfortable, physically challenging. Um, and so it's, it's all so very connected. Absolutely. And I, I think that's what the ability, um, learning music at an early age, it kind of trains our brain to be able to find those different, different areas and be good at them and mm-hmm. then kind of come back to music. I think that's why I think music is just kind of this, it's in our bodies. We, we may not know it. Um, and it may not be playing it, but the, the brain parts that it uses aren't used by anything else. And so we can open up to new things like karate or left-handed, whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think they come to us easier. So let's get deeper into your, your five principles. Yes. Um, can we start with collaborative skills? Collaborative skills, yes. I would say that's the number one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Being uh, able to work with people. Um, collaborative skills in all areas, not just playing with other musicians, but working with directors and producers and um, people who may not be musicians who you have to work with every day. Um, learning that, uh, I think, is a fundamental skill that when you're a, a young student, especially in music, you, you, you work with your teacher, you know, your, your personal teacher, and, and you learn repertoire. And it may be, you may be a little older when you start to collaborate or you have a band or something. Um, but it's how you work within that band, an ecosystem. You know, how do you, how do you support one another? How do, you, how do you understand one another when you don't play that instrument? How do you communicate what you need from someone else in order for you to do a good job? Um, you know, how can you make everything better collectively? Um, one of the exercises in uh, collaborative skills that, that I had the kids do was uh, you kind of have a – everyone stands in a circle and you create an imaginary shape and a sound and you kind of pass it on to the next person and their job is to morph it into a new shape and create a different sound. Um, you kind of go all the way around the room with that and then you look at the first shape and sound and the last shape and sound and you kind of just reflect on that for a minute. Now, I gave you all the same assignment. You know, you could have morphed it back to the same one. I didn't say you, you had you had to choose something different, but you always, but you all did choose something different. So, so if that's an opinion <laughs> or a musical idea, can you see how sometimes the collective might be better than you know, the individual idea? Mm-hmm. Um, and then you kind of I've I've been part of education programs here in Los Angeles where I was a, a musical artist for, I think an education artist for Los Angeles Master Chorale. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a program called the Voices Within program where we went into fifth grade classrooms and taught them collaborative songwriting, much in the same way. Um, everybody kind of contributes um, a portion, and every it's it's not strongly one person's idea or another another kid's idea. And these are non-musical kids. They're, they're not the ones that are taking band. These are the non-musical kids. Um, and we found that by the end of the course that we taught over eight weeks, the kids that didn't like each other were like best friends or it just taught, it taught everyone how to get along. And the, the feedback from the teachers would always be, wow, it's, we, we have to have this every year because it teaches the kids how to get along. And they, they create this thing and they're proud of it at the end. They're like, oh, oh, I, that's my group or my, my group contributed that to the song. And they're, they're so proud of it. And when their parents come and see and they're like, oh, it's just, it's amazing to see that, you know? Um, so again, it's about the kind of intrinsic feeling um, of collaboration and music. I think that was one fundamental thing that yeah, kind and, of passes through the years. And, and it's such an important part of, of a skill set that is, I think, undervalued and underlooked, mm-hmm. partially because the other part of the training of being a musician in, involves a great deal of isolated time. Mm-hmm. Which so there are so many <laughs> remarkable musicians that you and I both know, and I'm sure our listeners um, know as well, on a personal level that are just just indescribable in their their ability and their Absolutely. technique. But when it comes to social skills and interpersonal skills, they're lacking, you know, because they spent so much time in their room, mm-hmm. you know, with their instrument or in the practice room, and and uh, I believe it doesn't the the collaborative process doesn't really get taught enough Mm -hmm. um so i'm glad that that's an important yeah so that's one of the things about and again everyone will kind of skew 
uh, better in one area, but that was just one that I looked at and said, I think I've developed a skill of kind of um, managing a situation, okay. <laughs> good collaboration skills, like whatever I'm in. So that seemed to be something important to, to pass on. Okay. And next principle? That would be versatility. Okay. Um, versatility, again, is, uh, I think, a staple of what will keep you as a working musician for, you know, 25 years. Now, I'm, you know, I think some of the people are referring to brilliant musicians that um, we need in this world, absolutely, yeah. to inspire us and, and to make us want to go home and sit in a practice room for six hours at a time. Mm-hmm. And we need them right. in the world. And um, it's okay that they don't have great social skills. Um, or don't want to talk to people. I, I totally get that. Mm-hmm. But I think in mentoring a new generation, um, a principle that uh, the next principle of versatility um, is really important because as we just discussed, you know, I, I was a classical piano player. My dad had a pop group and I learned pop from an early age. I went to college for classical piano, but then I went into film scoring for my master's degree. And then, you know, I went into touring and I'm, what I'm doing now is is completely you know, I, if I hadn't have done those things, I couldn't do the job I'm doing now. Mm-hmm. But I'm, a, you know, at least 75% of my job is not musical. Mm-hmm. Um, so being versatile in that I could play different styles, but then I'm versatile, versatile technically. Like I, I know the software and Pro Tools and Ableton and Digital Performer, blah, blah, blah. Um, being versatile, I think, is also the key to a long-term career as a musician. Now I'm talking working musician, you know, if... Um, if someone wants to be the next, uh, oh, protege, you know, prodigal, mm-hmm. that, that's a different path. Right. But, um, but uh, I think to teach versatility, I think, is really important in this day and age um, because you're, you never know when you're going to use those skills or be the one to say, oh, I, I may not be the, the um, first choice in that, but at least I can bring that to the table. Mm-hmm. And with this other thing that you need me to do that I am an expert in, I, I at least know how to handle that. So I, I may not be the first choice in that area, but I can get it done. You know. Case in point, yeah. I I was just brought in in a really wonderful job f- doing a tribute with for Stephen Schwartz. Right. And after I was hired, then I got the call a week later saying, by the way, do you play banjo? <laughs> and there's the versatility right. aspect of it. If I did not, they would have needed to consider getting somebody else for yeah. the job. Yep. Case in point, actually, my first tour that mm-hmm. took me out of USC in my doctorate program was a tour uh, called Bugs Bunny on Broadway. Yeah. And I was the pianist for that show. And But my first job, which they didn't tell me until I was on the concert stage in Mexico City for my first concert and the first rehearsal, and there was this little dobro sitting next to the Are piano on me? a cart. This <laughs> <laughs> little dobro. And it had... um taped off on the frets here to here and a little side by and I'm like well who's playing that <laughs> <laughs> and the technical director from the, the show came this is literally 15 minutes before downbeat <laughs> this is my first now they really hired me kind of on the phone uh-huh. so it was just like I'm showing up in Mexico and I'm on stage and this is my first time working with these folks. And, right. And I'm just and, thinking what part of you being a classical or very versatile pianist and multi keyboardist right. leads to that you the assumption yeah. that you would know what to do with a dobro. So um technical director says, Okay, here's how you do this. <laughs> <laughs> just and this is now if you know the Bugs Bunny tunes, the first thing you hear in the any slide. of those con- uh, in any of those tunes is a brum da 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 right? So, and that was going to be me. <laughs> <laughs> now, my dad played guitar. Yeah. I had I learned a couple chords, yes, but dobro player, I would never claim that as anything. Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah, so I had actually play it. I had to put the slide in my right hand. Mm-hmm. I couldn't. I couldn't get it with my left hand. Mm-hmm. I couldn't get the s- strings to sound. I stressed out so much. So yeah, so I had from you know fret fret A to fret B, and it was taped off, and you play this. Um, in the middle and it, it started every song and I stressed out and the clicks going in my ears and I'm going oh oh god oh god, oh god let me screw this up because it was the first it was the first note that anyone right. I knew I should have it's stayed like, in school and got my PhD <laughs> so yeah so um, I wouldn't ever I wouldn't ever you know go out and be a a, a dobroist but at least being open to it and having the right open and willing yeah yeah um, to to allow that to, you know, be put on me and not say, you know, heck no, I'm not doing that. Um, 
yeah, so that's an example of being versatile. Um, I think as I think kids are being more interested in things um, which should be encouraged, you know, different instruments, different skills like songwriting or composing, not just playing. Um, interested in business, interested in creating their own videos. You know, I think all of that is versatility. Beautiful and crystal clear. Yeah. Um, would you say that um, self-discipline would fall next in line? Yes. So self-discipline to me is the ability to assess uh, how long it will take you to do something. And yeah. I think that's very important in this world. Like not only the self-discipline to sit down and do do something, like practice something so that you learn it, but also it helps you in a in a real life situation where someone's calling you for work like you could say yeah i can learn you know i can learn the banjo part or whatever you know that about yourself um it's it's knowing oh if you have to learn 20 uh, motown charts and you've never sung a motown song memorized by next week can i do that or not so it's learning enough about your ability and yourself to yes give yourself a challenge but also be realistic about you know is that is that really feasible for me to do because you're in a stronger position um, it, a lot of people these days, they or a lot of kids, they don't want to turn down something because that might be a great opportunity. But I think if self-discipline isn't really taught, then they can't assess correctly. So they may go in with the right intent saying, oh, I, I can learn those 20 tunes and just have it down for next week, but then really fall short and they really don't give a good performance, which then hurts their um, ability to um, get a job from that same person again. Right. So it's kind of being realistic. I think we're in a, a stronger position if we can assess um, assess our talent and our, our capability and our versatility correctly. And I think that self-discipline is really the principle that encapsulates that. And I, I never really thought about the, um, the really thinking, you know, assessing what is required to achieve the goal as part of the self-discipline. So mm-hmm. thank you for adding some clarity mm-hmm. to, for me in that, which is, kind of interesting because I'm an incredibly disciplined mm-hmm. and self-disciplined person, but but you just broadened my view of what self-discipline really means. Oh, well, thanks. I, I And again, that came from just, um, well, in your experience, you know, you have, I'm sure certain that you've worked with, you know, folks who you know are just amazing players, but they kind of fell short on something. Mm-hmm. And um, in that moment, you don't know what was going on in their week or blah, 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 but they end up hurting themselves because they just took this gig because they had to. And then right. they didn't um, they didn't really think it through like, oh, well, the longer game is I want to make sure I get called back. Right. You know, it's... or I want to get the next call. So I'm in a stronger position if I say, you know what, I'm, I'm probably just bogged this week or I had something come up. Um, probably need to pass on this. And kids, I think, are so eager, you know, um, why I think it's part of a, a great kind of um, – whole education now is teaching not just the self-discipline of I can practice for six hours, but then how do I assess what I can do um, with what I learn in that six hours? <laughs> Moving on, uh, would would you say is it marketing or entrepreneurship that would come next? In, uh, well, the marketing, I think they go hand in hand. Okay. Um, marketing and the particular exercise for the kids that I had them do was create your mission statement. Like, what do you want to do? Who are you? What do you do now? And what do you want to do? Those three simple things. And it's Say them again. <laughs> okay. Who are you? What do you do? And what do you want to do? Um, when someone asks you a question, it's, it's interesting with our iPhone age these, and, these days, asking simple questions people don't know how to answer, um, and especially kids. They get very tongue-tied or they don't know, you know, what do you want to do? Oh, I don't know. I'm thinking about this or thinking about that. And that makes you feel it's – Marketing is kind of from from day one the impression you make. So they may, if you come across as someone I would say is wishy washy or not not really stable, um, people can't help you. So my um, my determination putting marketing as far as knowing your knowing who you are and what your mission is and where you want to go with it is very important these days because we kind of live in a world of just being um, hit constantly with marketing (laughs) and information. Mm -hmm. And if you are not sure, I don't know, I don't know this, I don't know that, then you can be very sure that 10 seconds later that same person's going to get hit with someone who knows very 
distinctly what they're what they want and right. what they want to do. So I an exercise that we went through with these kids and I think is important if if we all just take a moment to do this for ourselves is come up with what's our what's our mission or what do we um who are we? <laughs> what do we do and where do we want to go with it? Um and I I think that gives us very clear conversation tools. Um, it also gives us very clear marketing tools. Um, and then you can design things around that. You know, like we think of marketing as, oh, we got to get the marketing out there for our gigs. But it, it's actually uh, the core of that is this message of just who are we, <laughs> what do we do, and where are we going with it? And then the marketing is shining the mm-hmm. light on that exactly. intention. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. So that was one of the exercises that we did with the kids, and it was very effective because it – it made them kind of get up and tell each other, you know, this is what I want to do. I'm not just taking this art class, but here's my goal, you know. Um, and I said in conversation when you're networking and meeting with people, then they can they can participate in that, saying, you know what, I know someone you should talk to because they're aligned with you. Right. And that's how you create relationships and, and kind of begin this journey of being a creative person. And creating relationships is not to be undervalued. Not at all. Not at all. I can tell you, in fact, in the current position I'm in, um, Cirque du Soleil and I have been uh, developing relationship for 10 years. Right. So this was uh, a long time kind of coming, what I'm doing now. Um, so in that first initial one was when I was actually uh, working with Wicked. Mm-hmm. And I met them um, in, they came to see ter- uh, me in Toronto with Wicked and then brought me up to Montreal and I met the casting team. And then I became a talent scout for a little bit and helped them find musicians. And then over the years, they've asked me, you know, about considering positions for the shows and timing just never worked out with other things I was working on. So, um, again, relationship building from that very first, you know, it's not about this time. It's about the next time. I always say that, too, about relationships. And so what's a, an example of marketing that you teach the kids to in your workshop? Well, I will get into um, the next component of that would then go into the entrepreneurship cycle so what i have them do or what one exercise we did was i asked them who in the mark who is a creative person that they uh that they aspire to be mm-hmm. or that they see is big in the marketplace and it was justin timberlake and you know jennifer lopez and um so we actually did an exercise where i said okay look at all the do they just sing what do they do so, um, again, this is kind of fundamentals of marketing, but before we talk about being a marketer for yourself, it's kind of understanding, well, look at, look at what other artists are doing. So, and you, and it kind of goes along with the entrepreneurship side and what they discovered for themselves was, you know, JLo, well, she's, if you look at it on a blackboard and mm-hmm. write it all down, you know, JLo is an actress, she's a singer, she owns a, um, she has a fragrance, she has a clothing line. You know, she's all these things. Well, Beyonce, too. I mean, the list goes on and on. You look at these icons in, in our industry and you break down what they actually do. Um, then the conversation kind of turns. How much of it is their music marketing for these other things? Or or is music their thing? Like, So it's a fundamental question to ask the kids, you know, what do you think? Do they all work? Is it just like a symbiotic relationship? Do they make money in music? Where do they really make their money? Do they use their um, status in music to then promote these other physical products that they sell? <laughs> you know, So then as far as the, the they start to think differently about um, you know, music is something you feel and you do. But um, in this world, I believe you need to have more physical business you know, um, products and things to sell. Um, and so they, they, then they start to think, okay, well, how can I use my creative skill, like writing a book or creating a song? Um, what, other than just being a song, what's the other, what's the, what's the product behind that? You know, is it a video about how I made it? Is it a book about something I've learned? Is it creating an identity? You know, is it a, what's my brand, you know, marketing and branding? So it's a kind of a deep, it goes by kind of layers and deeper conversation. And then when they, um, they kind of come up with um, an assessment for themselves about taking their talent, looking at all these business possibilities, um, then to break it down in entrepreneurship and how do I pursue that and put this all together in a plan. Um, one of the things that I, um, one of the tools that was the very first lesson of the um, 
technology entrepreneurship program at Stanford was this thing called the Business Model Canvas. And you can go online and just Google Business Model Canvas. It's a one-page, kind of a one-page business plan, if you will, with um, these key concepts that will say, who's your customer, um, who are your suppliers, who's your – it really just kind of blatantly um, breaks down the components of a business. So then – I asked the kids to go through that. We would do an example. So we break down JLo's just one of her businesses and do like this business model canvas for, you know, where does she get her inventory? How much does she charge? <laughs> who are the designers? You know, who is involved? Um, who does she need to hire? Um, and create that for them. And then they can kind of duplicate that. So if it's for a CD or for a tour or whatever, then the kids have a very clear, um, oh, it's not just as, you know, it's not just being viral on YouTube. Um, type of mentality about it's a broader being an entrepreneur. picture mm -hmm. of of all of the elements mm -hmm. involved in being successful mm -hmm. and it actually it's very concise which is actually mm. actually great for all of us and it's not overwhelming so it um i know myself you know you get going down a rabbit hole of research you know trying to is this the right is this the right thing to put on facebook is this <laughs> the right you know do i need to design this a different way is this that you kind of get on a rabbit hole but um just kind of having a concise um palette where I just solve just fill in these blanks you know and just create something from that and then then assess it so that's I think the other um, lesson in entrepreneurship you know not everything's going to work um, but not everything's going to fail <laughs> so I think our challenge um, is also uh, not stopping ourselves from trying um, because there's so many options and you're not sure what the right one is you just kind of have to get it out of you and do it and if it works okay perfect run with it and then you know what your market is and where you can channel you know more effort if it doesn't work then you know well go back and i'll try another idea you know marketing and try another concept try another product um at least that's that's my concept of this kind of entrepreneurial mindset instead of committing ourselves to this one thing that if it if it we just have to keep doing it until, you know, even if it takes up, you know, the rest of our lives, um, we just can't try anything else other than this one specific thing, if that makes sense. Like it does. <clears throat> so before I, I get to my closing questions, mm -hmm. because we're coming to the end of our conversation, yes. uh, tell everybody where they can find out more about you. We're, we're going to, of course, post all of your web links and everything. Mm -hmm. But if our listeners want to know more about your upcoming seminars and teaching, mentoring, education, as well as performance, uh, things that you're doing. Um, should we send them to your website? Um, website or actually Facebook. Facebook. Um, I have fan okay. page on Facebook. Message me on Facebook. Okay. It's probably the um, quickest way that I'll get it. And which address is that? We'll post it as well. That's the uh, Christy, Fowl Christy Crowl official. So facebook.com slash Christy Crowl official. It's kind of my fan page. Okay. Um, and I'll be posting some things. So upcoming, um, as you and I kind of discussed previously, I'm hoping to develop a workshop out of these five principles um, to help teachers um, kind of explain this in the classroom and maybe work it into their curriculum, um, arts teachers, arts and music teachers. So right now I'm, I'm hoping to assemble um, a, a kind of a first wave of interested teachers that would want to just work with me for maybe three or four sessions in July over the summer to just hear what you're doing in the classroom and how these principles can kind of be incorporated into that and then eventually maybe create a, a workshop, an online workshop or a, co a live conference for um, music and arts teachers and their students you know, to come together to something like this where they get kind of a full body experience of here's what life in the arts um, can look like you know, in the future. And the, this group of educators that you are looking to assemble mm -hmm. do not need to be located in any, any particular area no. because you're, we're going to be Skyping. And yeah, this will be kind of an online um, thing right now, and I'm looking at July. So feel free to message me if you listen to this before, you know, July, or even if it's after July, <laughs> to <laughs> please um, just reach out to me uh, on Facebook and write me a message, and I'll um, get back to you and let you know what's going on with that. It's kind of in the works right now, so I, I don't want to say anything definite, but that's my target right now. Well, consider that a personal invitation from Christy to, yes, to reach please. out and, and, um, I am going to be involved as well. Absolutely. So I've, I've already accepted her invitation and I, and I look <clears throat> forward to being a part of this mentoring 
team of superheroes that, <laughs> you Go know, team. wide Go awake, team. <laughs> <laughs> passionate, intention, clear yes. uh, group of, of people that, that you're assembling. Uh, I want to get to my closing questions. Mm-hmm. Uh, and there are three parts to this. The first is a two part question. Since this show is called Making It, mm-hmm. what does making it mean to you both personally and professionally? Making it is not losing who you are despite of the world. I I don't really affiliate monetary success with making it. I I affiliate character success. Um, I've seen success change people. um, And then they become a prisoner to that success. And that's not making it to me. Um, I think making it is is staying true to who you're here to be. And... um, yeah, I guess that's as succinct as I can say it. Thank you. <laughs> can you share three tips for success that have driven your career? Be kind. Be devoted and have integrity. And my last question. At this point of your life, Christy, with everything that you know to be true, what would you tell your younger self? Oh, goodness. You have no idea what's coming. <laughs> Amen. But it, but it'll be all right. <laughs> and on that note, <laughs> um, we thank you for joining us. Christy, oh, thank, thank you, you so, so much. much for spending the hour with me. Oh, the pleasure is mine. The pleasure is mine. I think I, I hope everyone out there knows what a wonderful, genuine, and incredibly talented person you are. And um, to be doing this for artists, I think, is amazing as well. So thank you for what you bring to this, too. I really appreciate that. (laughs) And all of you listening, uh, thanks for spending the hour with us. Christy Kral, um, you're an absolute joy and a talent. And um, we will see you all next week. So thanks, everybody. Thank you. Have a great week. Hi, I'm Terry Wallman, and you're listening to Making It with Terry Wallman. I'm here with Christy Crowell, and we just finished a really wonderful interview, but there was one question that I didn't get to that um, I just thought I would ask you as a bonus question, and we can share this as we are doing now on Facebook and Twitter and everywhere else. You speak about community a lot. You use the word community, the artist community, our community of musicians, the global community of, of people. What does community mean to you, and why is it important? Well, I think community is a, a safe place where we feel we, be- we belong, um, whatever ecosystem that is. Mine, it's music, and you and I have both traveled around the world, and I feel we have a community around the world that just because we, we share a common interest, um, we can communicate with each other. Um, so, I, And I believe it's important, especially in this world, to feel like you belong somewhere um and feel like you've been validated for what you do um so much of uh, what we do now is validation online you know i do this i do that but i think being in a community (laughs) um, brings more self-satisfaction of yeah i i i do have a talent i do i do um people i am recognized um not just you know with Facebook likes, but my community kind of recognizes the work that I do. And I feel that that's, that's what drives us to be better um, in, a, in a lot of cases, you know, because we, not just that someone says, oh, you're great at that, but but that maybe you see somebody smile at, at what you do, or you're just like, oh, gosh, I listened to that thing and the other night that you played on it. Oh, my God, it just made my heart sing, you know, or I just cried. It's that community creates connection. Um, it could be a fan community. It could be um, well, uh, musical community or art- artistic community, I just feel we have this common bond. And it is very important, I think, um, in this world to feel part of a community because we isolate ourselves with all these devices <laughs> and we, lo- we lose the ability to connect with each other. So um, community to me just means being in a safe place where we feel like we belong, you know, that we're home. Thanks, Christy. (laughs) (laughs) That's great. If uh, if you want to hear the entire conversation, you can log on to entertalkmedia.com slash making it and hear an hour of Christy and myself talking about uh, music, life, and all things important. Yes. Can't wait. Thanks again. Can't wait. Thank you.
Tune in again next week for another great episode of Making It with Terry Wolfe.